here to talk about GraphQL and what is it and what does it do. So we've been using REST APIs because in, apps have to communicate with each other. So you have a server, you have a client, maybe you have two servers, and they have to communicate with, other, with each other in some manner. So they use APIs, or application programming interfaces. I'm gonna do a brief review about what REST APIs are, what they do, what they provide for us, before we move on to like what GraphQL is, because it is an alternative to REST APIs. So before there was REST, there was SOAP. Um, and SOAP was like a different, um, uh, format, different protocol for APIs, simple object access protocol, I believe. It was bad for a variety of reasons that I'm not going to go into, um, but REST is short for representational state transfer, wherein resources are exposed via numerous endpoints. Some of the advantages of REST as opposed to its predecessor was that, um, first of all, in REST architectures, all of the transactions are supposed to be stateless. So the server doesn't need to know how many requests you have done in the past. It forgets. So it does the transaction and then it's done, it forgets about it. Um, another thing is separation of concerns. So the API shouldn't have to know um, how the client is going to be using it, right? So the API shouldn't be concerned with UI. Likewise, the client shouldn't, be have, shouldn't have to worry about data storage, right? When you're building a React app, your React app doesn't really care if the API is touching a Postgres database or if it's fetching information from other APIs or if it's doing some data manipulation before it gets to you. A uh, quick asterisk here, I mentioned that REST APIs are stateless. That's not entirely true, because as we've seen, REST APIs often implement some kind of sessions, and sessions do introduce some degree of you know, statefulness. Um, but that's kind of an exception. We just kind of like let that one go, because it's necessary for authentication flows. Um, REST APIs, you have to bake a bunch of different endpoints. Um, and so there are different types of endpoints, and they're supposed to correlate with the HTTP requests. So you've got gets, posts, puts, deletes, and all the others. Um, and uh, yeah, so how many endpoints do we need for, say, like a simple blogging application where we have users who write posts and the blog posts themselves? Well, we should have to authenticate, right? So we have to have a flow for that, like slash API slash me or whatever. We have to retrieve retrieve that user's data, modify user data, retrieve blog posts, edit a blog post, delete a blog post, create a blog post, create a new user. We forgot about that one, right? How are we going to make users in the first place? It can get a little bit hairy. Um, now, granted, there's always a good and a bad way to write a rest, RESTful API. And so, to be fair, you can have some really custom query parameters to reduce the number of endpoints. And granted, a lot of the endpoints are kind of boilerplate. They're sort of the same. Nonetheless, whenever the client has a new need, um, a new endpoint has to be either created or an old one has to be modified. So what happens when the specs change, in other words? Like when our blogging application all of a sudden needs to incorporate comments and likes and shares. So your project manager calls you up and says, oh, we need a whole bunch more endpoints. You have to go rewrite those endpoints that you've already made or create new ones. And that can make for a sad <laughs> monkey. <laughs> So it would be really great if we had a much more fluid, a much more um, agile way of building a backend and building a client that can retrieve information from that backend. Um, one of the, this is just a great Twitter quote that I saw, and I think it encapsulates a lot of what it's like to be a web developer. It's not like the code is hard, it's that everything is interconnected in kind of this weird way. It's like you're trying to fit in like a square peg into a, um, a round hole sometimes. And so a lot of times the innovations are just in around how different things communicate with each other, even if in isolation they are working the same as they were before. Um, so GraphQL is supposed to be a solution to some of these problems we're having with RESTful APIs. It's supposed to be a lot more agile. So things get a little bit weird. Um, first of all, unlike RESTful APIs where you have a whole bunch of different endpoints, there is only one endpoint for a GraphQL server. And all you do is send post requests to it. There are no get, there's no delete, there's no put. You send post requests to one endpoint. And all the things that you need, that you are expecting to get from this GraphQL server, are inside of this post body. Um, there are data types now. That's kind of weird, right? So in the past, what we've been doing with, say, get requests is like, you might have a param in the URL if you want to grab the user ID, right? But you don't really know if, GraphQ, if the server you're talking to thinks of that ID as a string or as a number, right? you don't particularly care. Um, likewise, when you're getting data back, 
you don't really know what to expect, right? So if you're going to grab, say, um, we ran into this with our Grace Shopper program. Um, when you're trying to figure out, say, um, how many items are in an order before you check out in an e-commerce site, um, is that going to be an array of objects, or is that going to be an object where each key maps to a value of some data in it? Um, from the client perspective, you don't know until you've made the request and you get it back. Um, with GraphQL, things are a little bit different. You actually have to specify the type of the data you're expecting to get back, and GraphQL knows how to interpret that. Um, likewise, the response mirrors the request. So we'll, we'll see an example of that in just a moment here. Right. So. Um, on the left side is an example of a request. So uh, this is pulled directly from the GraphQL docs, and it's a pretty concise and informative example. So you're requesting a human with ID 1000. And what you want from that human is the name and the height. Right? Straightforward enough. And on the right, notice how the structure is the same. So there's this data key at the very top, and then human, and then the name and the height. Straightforward enough, right? So what's interesting about this is because the structure is the same, you can kind of create an object on the front end and just sort of fill in the bucket. It's like the, the object already has the fields ready to go, and then as soon as you make your query, boom, they're all filled in. You don't have to manipulate them. I mean, you might if you want to, but you can structure your objects such that they, are, such that they don't need to be manipulated. Um, so let's try it out. We're going to do some demos. I'm going to show you some code. And I want to point out real quick a great shout out to this excellent Medium post, um, James Childs. Uh, made, made a fantastic little tutorial about how to set up like the minimum possible GraphQL server, which is what I'm going to show you now. Okay, so I'm going to increase the font size a lot. So do 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 do, and we're going to compress all of these so we can see them from a bird's eye view. Do 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 do. <clears throat> so I have this. Um, Little NPM project with only three dependencies. I've just got Express, Express GraphQL, and GraphQL. So there's a variety of ways to serve a GraphQL server, but we all like Express here, so that's what I'm going to use. And there's nothing else in this project except for this package JSON and this server file here. So we are importing our node modules and GraphQL initialization, where we're basically just saying, like, here are the different types I'm going to use. Here's what I'm going to do with them. Um, this here is our data. So um, this is an important point. A lot of people confuse GraphQL with a server or a database. It, it isn't. So GraphQL doesn't really care where the data is coming from. In this case, I'm using just a straight up JavaScript object, which I'll expand, which is an object with some keys that are IDs, and then they go down to these characters, actors, roles, traits, really. So uh, in this case, it's a JavaScript object, but it could be a SQLite file, or it could be a Postgres database, or it could be some other API entirely. You could wrap a RESTful API with a GraphQL server if you wanted to. But here, it's just like the simplest case. Um, you also have to define your model types. So by the way, the guy who wrote this Medium post, who I'm borrowing this from, really likes to show Goldbergs. So all this data is Goldberg characters. Um, so here, we're just defining in the Goldberg types the name, the description, the fields. And notice here, there's this description thing. So this is basically how GraphQL self-documents the code. So when you're querying something, you can have this IDE that kind of fills in tags for what you're going to request. It's super cool. I'll show it to you in a minute if I don't run out of time. Um, and then you have to specify the resolver function. This kind of is like, to me, opening up the black box of GraphQL. The resolver function defines how it is you actually resolve a query. How do you get the data? So in this case, because our data is just um, a JavaScript object, we're just going to say return Goldbergs of the ID, because it's an array, or it's an object. Um, we're going to specify a simple query type. Uh, and here we have this resolve. So we're plugging in our resolve function. And then a schema type basically just says, hey, this schema has one query, and it's this query I defined above. So this is the one thing you can do with this GraphQL server. This would be much longer if your GraphQL server were bigger and had more data in it. And then you hit run. And so I'm going to do npm start. And then doo -doo -doo -doo, we're going to take a look at it. Um, not there. Localhost 8080. Um, GraphQL has this amazing thing built in called graphical. Um, graph I Q L. I didn't do anything. I just set a certain field to true when I ran my server. And you can run interactive queries here. I'm going to do my history real quick and do this one. So notice my query here. Is that visible? Can you guys see that down on the bottom? Is that a little bit better? Do, do, do. I can't. I'll just erase all these comments. 
Okay, so now I've got this query, so I'm going to do Goldberg with ID 1, command enter, and it oop, gives me an error. Notice, however, this is a really informative error. It's telling me some information about like what's going wrong. Um, I think I had a better one logged up in my history. This one is probably better. Yeah, here we go. So I'm going to erase these comments again. So notice my query has ID, character, role, actor, traits. These are all the things I'm requesting from this object. I can get rid of actor, and the corresponding one no longer has it. Um, also, I'm going to hit comma, and then if I do control space, it's going to give me some tab completion. It knows what my GraphQL server can respond with, so it gives them to me kind of as options. This isn't something you could do with a RESTful API. Um, without the server basically publishing some documentation about what you could request from it, there'd be no way for the client to be able to do that. But GraphQL is a lot smarter. There's a million more things that I could cover, like how would you actually hook this up to a React API, React app, but I'm totally out of time, so that's it.